Now that the previews are over with, we can have our main presentation. Our speaker tonight is Ned Heindel, who is a professor of chemistry at Lehigh University, and he is a local historian of the area. He has authored five books on local history and has published nine journal articles on historical topics. Ned and his wife, Linda, live on Hexenkopf, did I say that right, Road, in Williams Township, and he serves on the boards of Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society and the Williams Township Historical Society. And his slideshow tonight, this is going to be very interesting, uh, his presentation covers the rise and fall of Reddington and its impact on the development of no Northern Lower Saucon Township. All right, so welcome to that. I'll try not to bluff at your view, but I'm going to work you here. At the uh, first of all, let's start with a plug for the Northampton County Historical Society. The umbrella organization for all of us. Williams Township, Lower Salton, Forks. Uh, we need worker bees. We need them desperately to guide people through the museum, to take care of our financial records. It's, it's a volunteer operation. And uh, I know some of you have time on your hands. There's a woman over on the side here who goes out for lunch almost every day with her daughter. <laughs> Maybe I can get her to sign up as a guide. <laughs> Any of you interested in being a volunteer, call the museum and just say, I'd like to be a volunteer. You'll get the proper training and you're, you're good to go. This is, uh, I've been working on Reddington <coughs> since the 1960s. And when we moved here, we bought some horses. Uh, my wife grew up on a horse farm. She liked horses. There is a trail that goes out the back of our property uh, over uh, Hexacoff Mountain, crosses Pat Manana's land, veers around the tower, the, uh, uh, the radio tower, and drops down onto the tracks of the uh, old Lehigh Valley Railroad. Uh, at Reddington. It is not far. It, uh, it's a very interesting place to ride to, and uh, the trail eventually grew up, but we didn't ride it very often. So let's start with a, a question. What do you think these iron workers have in common with these kids and with these young women? Well, the answer is, at one time or another, they all lived and worked in Reddington, Lower Salkin, 1865 to 1922, at various time periods. The first group of men were largely connected with the iron and steel operation uh, that existed for about the first 30 years of the site. And then it moved into a crucible steel operation. Uh, for a while, it was a reformatory. We'll talk about that. And then it became, in World War I, its most famous occupation, a humongous shell-filling munitions plant and gunnery testing site. Uh, I think it's the second biggest in the nation, which you folks should remember when talking about its preservation. Now, where is it? Uh, if Lenny Sly were here tonight, and I don't see him in the audience, uh, he would offer to take us on a midnight or a moonlight hike, <laughs> because we're almost there. Uh, this is Route 78. This is Apple Butter Road. We're right here now. If you draw a line straight north, it's 0 0.62 miles from where you're sitting to the square of Reddington. The square is the intersection of the two streets. It's like the square in Robsville. It's uh, uh, equally well laid out. So you're, you're barely seven tenths of a mile from Reddington. Unfortunately, uh, you'll get killed crossing tw uh, 78. <laughs> before you ever get there, but we're quite, quite close to Reading. It's halfway between Bethlehem and Easton on the south bank of the Lehigh River, and uh, it's still recognized on the <coughs> maps and all the geological survey maps. This uh, town has a short but interesting history. It was founded by a couple uh, working together, more him than her, but when he, since he died early, it became all her and no him. Uh, <coughs> 
William Thornton Carter and Cornelia Reddington Carter. Uh, they both had money. It's a little like uh, Donald Trump. She <laughs> inherited about a million. He inherited about two million in the dollars of the time. Uh, her money came from being the heiress to a shipping company that shipped iron ore on the Great Lakes. And his money came from tin mines in Cornwall. So they didn't start life impoverished. They took a, a, a million or so each from their parents and turned it into what would be today around 70 or 80 million if you adjust it for inflation. They were quite successful. She turned out to be a better businessman than him, which is uh, quite good. Why did they pick this spot to build a little community? Well, there was a community there already, three houses. It was called Lime Ridge. And the three houses stood about where the opening is now to the uh, uh, gunnery works, to the uh, Bethlehem, the local <coughs> city rod and gun clubs uh, entrance. There were, there were some small homes there, and some limestone miners lived there, uh, chipping away at the mountain. The limestone is really very high quality. Lehigh University has an analysis uh, done on the quality of the limestone uh, in 1868. There was so little sand in that limestone, it was under 13% sand, that you didn't get much waste slag when you used the limestone to flux steel. So for, uh, for making iron, it's good limestone. It's still good limestone. The coal was cheap. There were plenty of local iron mines. Easy shipping, you had the, the river out there, you had the railroad on both sides of the river, and you had the canal on the north bank. All were used for shipping. Very soon after the community gets started at growing commercially, Mrs. Carter develops a special focus for it. Uh, her husband literally tried to compete with Bethlehem Steel, but he never had enough money, and uh, he was not willing to burn his entire fortune on this. And rarely did he exceed 50,000 50, tons of uh, iron products per year. 50,000 tons per iron product, even back then, it's a little small. So this, this is a, a little bit small for a, uh, a forge. This is probably too small for you to read, but let me capsulize it. I mentioned he came from Cornwall. He came with his father. Uh, and the two of them worked for Asa Packer, building uh, coal cars for the Lehigh Valley Railroad. He immigrated in 1850, and while they're up there managing and building coal cars, his son gets the idea, hey, let's buy a coal mine. And he plays a lucky strike. There's an abandoned mine called the Beaver Meadows Mine, another name, Coal Rain was the company. But it, the coal vein had petered out, and everybody was sure the mine was worthless. So he got it for chicken change. And he no longer had, he no, he no sooner had a crew in there in two or three weeks than they'd hit a rich vein of coal. The mine was still producing coal to the, uh, to the present time. It was the core of his uh, wealth, a very rich coal mine. So he bought it in 1861 and struck it big. 1867, Asa Packer is laying out the railroad lines. And a steam engine can't get very far in those days. You gotta fill it up with water every so many miles. You gotta shovel on more coal. It wasn't very efficient. So he decides to place his first watering hole between Bethlehem and Easton, halfway between it, bingo, Reddington. So Asa buys 65 acres uh, around uh, Reddington and puts in a water tower and a coal refueling station. At that point, the uh, Carter becomes aware of this and says, I can do more with that. Uh, and he buys it from Asa, Asa Packer. So it passes from local farmer owners to the founder of Lehigh University to uh, Carter in the space of about three years. And Carter has great visions for this. He's going to make it his company town. There was already Durham out there uh, from Bull Durham, the tobacco company. There's Hershey for chocolates. There's Dearborn, Michigan for Ford. One of the things you did if you were a wealthy industrialist is started a community. And so he started a town. He laid out two streets.
Carter Street and Main Street. He built 37 double-sided uh, homes, double homes, in the bright red. Uh, built a school, a church, worked out a connection to the Moravian Church so he didn't have to pay a pastor. The Moravians would send out on the train a student minister every Sunday. Uh, they'd pay his train fare. He'd give a sermon, hop back on the train, and go back to the seminary. Uh, that's cheap salvation. Uh, as I said, he expanded the operation twice, ultimately ending up at about 40,500 tons per year of, uh, of steel that it could make. And then he died. Uh, he died leaving in a state in which a panel of four men was to take care of his wife. I don't want my wife to be troubled by anything financial. Uh, I want the, uh, you guys to run this and take care of my wife handsomely. Handsomely is correct. They had a home uh, near the Breakers in uh, Rhode Island. They had a home in Melbourne, Florida. They had a home on Walnut Street in Philadelphia. And they had two homes in Reddington, one on the South Bank, one on the North Bank. Uh, these people were not poor. All the homes were open all the time and stacked. She could arrive and expect to be served dinner that night. Uh, so uh, she doesn't inherit. Instead, she inherits protection. She doesn't want protection. She's watched her husband run this thing for years, and she sort of reached the conclusion, you're nuts to compete with Bethlehem Steel. I think there's another way to handle this. <coughs> so the... Uh, uh, what was done is she persuaded the trustees to let her manage the estate. And they did that by putting the property up for sale in a public auction where nobody knew about the auction except her. <laughs> <laughs> she bought it for a dollar. And, and the trustees said that they had fulfilled their duty to their late good friend, and she becomes the owner of the, uh, of the property. And what she goes into is a new mechanism, customized steel alloy what we call crucible steel. Uh, the steel that we use to make wrenches, to make corrosion-resistant pipes, to make hammers. There's, there's enough of a market for uh, high-quality crucible steel. She also leased the site to many other uh, people. A couple of years ago, Linda and I went to visit the family homestead. Uh, William T. Carter is from Breeze, Cornwall. His family coal mine, uh, family tin mine, is now filled to the brim with water. <laughs> which is one of the reasons they got Cornwall. The mine was starting to fill up with uh, water. The family church exists. Uh, his father, who came over to the United States with him, was very unhappy here, didn't like American living styles, and went back to Cornwall, leaving the son with a small fortune. And the, the father lies in the uh, churchyard, along with his mother, uh, a brother, and two sisters. The town is called Breeze, Breeze Cornwall. That's the name of the town. And you'll see that name crop up again. They named their home in Reddington, Breeze Cottage. Breeze Cottage is the name. They wouldn't have gotten the shot that they got had it not been for a good relationship with Asa Packer. Uh, Asa was a good friend to both the senior Carter and the junior Carter, uh, and they did business with him. At Asa's 50th wedding anniversary, uh, young Carter, he wasn't all that young by that time, he was in his 50s, I had a plan to attend an immense party that was going to be given at Lehigh for Ace's 50th wedding anniversary. But he got sick. So he had, a, he, he had custom printed a, a letter to Asa apologizing for not showing up and had a, 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 a private livery man deliver that from his home in Philadelphia to uh, Bethlehem to show Asa but I'm sorry I can't be there for the big to-do. This is Packer Carter and Company, a, uh, a car construction company in Hazel. Uh, the partnership didn't last all that long, not because anybody was unhappy with anybody else, but Asa was getting increasingly interested in uh, railroads as owning the railroad, not just the cars that ran on it, and the Carters were getting interested in coal and iron. So uh, it was business that caused them to separate, they sold the company to a third party. But Asa Packer's decision to plop a refueling place at Reddington for the run between Easton and Bethlehem 
made sense in the 1850s and 1860s. Soon the capacity of trains to go much further than that develops. And Reddington would have been superfluous and redundant as any kind of a refueling station because we developed the ability to go far, much further uh, engines than in those days. But for that time, Reddington is rolling along as its own little community. Here's the 1873 map of Reddington, which comes out of the County Historical Atlas. Uh, this is the main street, Mrs. Carter Street. Uh, at the height of this, there were 37 of these homes, and they were each doubles painted red. Uh, the machine shop here still stands. Uh, the furnace foundation is there. The store is here. Here's the chapel that you folks as an organization that helps uh, try to save, at least put a historical marker there. Here's the school. And each of these squiggly little things is a quarry. There's a lot of limestone quarry in here. At the height of the post office operation, uh, for which these good folks, great grandfather, yeah. he was the postmaster for a while, uh, the uh, post office operation was applied for in 1869. He had barely gotten the town underway by that time. It was granted in 1870, and it was an official post uh, office into the late 1920s. The post office was right there uh, by the general store, and 12 was a luxury hotel. Didn't know you had a luxury hotel in North Salt. Wait till I show you some luxury hotel. So, alas, the, the, this structure was built as the chapel. It was used occasionally as a school. It fell into bad times a few years ago. Uh, Priscilla could probably tell you more of a story about how that. Yes, Mr. Mara. Oh, Mr. Mara. God bless him. Uh, he's off somewhere yeah. buying up bees. <laughs> But anyway, we tried to save it, but I gather you couldn't raise enough money. But at least there's a historical marker on the site. This is the Clark Hotel, and it was fixed up reasonably well in the late 60s and 1970s in the apartment house, but it burned down. It was a luxury hotel in Reddington, and it was number 12 in my uh, former map, if you will. So if you went to Reddington, there was a place you could get water and fed and sleep uh, overnight. Let's talk about the evolution of the iron business. <clears throat> I've already given you this uh, background here. Carter starts a blast furnace operation, very much along the lines of the kind of smelter that he used to smelt tin back in Cornwall. Surprisingly similar, to the point that the buildings even look like his own buildings on his Cornwall tin mine. The, the engine house for sustaining a blast in order to keep the uh, air moving through the molten iron looks exactly like the engine house that he built, like his father built in Cornwall uh, 30 years before that. We visited that uh, engine house. So Mrs. Carter switches the business from an open competition with the uh, major steel players of the valley. Because all that William T. was doing in the last year or two of his life was going around and knocking on the door of the Glendon furnace, the southeastern furnace, Bethlehem furnace and saying, if you ever get an order that's too big for you to fill in the time period, give <coughs> me the extra work. Uh, I, he was doing fill-in work for uh, other uh, iron manufacturers. But when they switched to the custom casting business, it really took off. And there were several companies that in succession rented the property for that. An H.H. Adams company, a company called Reddington Steel, uh, which was a bunch of outside investors. And eventually, Bethlehem Steel steps in and rents the property in 1912. I have some very precious photographs given to me uh, by a woman named Molly Mellon, who will come up very shortly on this. Uh, unfortunately, this one is a double exposure of sorts, but it's from the North Bank looking toward uh, the South Bank. Uh, Reddington Road is coming right in here. This stone structure here is all that remains above ground of the, it's the engine house for the, the former blast furnace. And uh, these were uh, forging and uh, shaping operations. This is before the munitions works. This is probably uh, around uh, 1885, 1890. And here's the lock, which is later renamed Republic Lock. You're looking down the hill 
St. Luke's Hospital is to, is to my back, the uh, Anderson campus of St. Luke's, and we're looking across the, uh, the river. And here's the Lehigh Valley Railroad coming and curving around and ready. I just wish it were be better, but it's not. So here are some of these red painted homes. This is a black and white, we'll never see that they're red. This, this is the end of the road uh, of worker homes. In addition to those worker homes, there were a series of worker homes here and along here, along what's now known as Reddington Road. So all in all, about 250 people got their mail at Reddington. They wouldn't all be living within the confines of the town. Uh, this is pretty well overgrown now, but it's still a nice walk. This is the, uh, what's left of the engine house, the uh, source of the compressed airstream to uh, fuel the furnaces. It was built vertically, and it appears that most of the mechanics hung from steel rods that were reinforced from the ground up. It was a bizarre way you could get at the engine from all sides. It's kind of a bizarre way to build uh, an engine house. And there are enormous steel rods still embedded in the masonry when you look up. Uh, Mrs. Carter was advised by uh, a number of friends over the years to tear the damn thing down. <laughs> it's raining bricks. If you walked in there, you could be hit on the head by a brick at any one point, at any given time. From uh, about 1890 on, nobody maintained the thing. But until her death in 1984, <clears throat> she wouldn't let anybody tear it down. She regarded it as uh, a monument to her uh, late husband. It's still there. It hasn't. Uh, the pipeline is going to come awful close, <laughs> and the right of way for the pipeline is going to uh, include this on the ground. It doesn't look like the center line of the pipeline will get there. This is the Carter's engine house in Greenwich Cornwall. Uh, tall vertical structure. That's not the uniform architecture. A lot of Cornwall tin mines, the engine house was a one story building. Uh, I'm a chemist, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I don't know why you put the engine vertically. You could put it horizontally, but uh, probably makes it a lot easier to drain the oil this time to do a job. <laughs> the crucible steel production was done on much smaller quantities. <coughs> and these were highly customized alloys uh, for which the largest market turned out to be uh, deck fittings for ocean going ships and tankers. The kinds of things that the when you're tying the boat up to the dock, you wrap the, the rope around this. They, uh, they, they found a niche market in the marine deck fittings area and also in a uh, tools area. Bethlehem Steel takes an increasing interest in the property. Along around 1888, somebody, and I can't find out from the records, although I think it was uh, Mrs. Carter's brother, uh, Walter Reddington manages to persuade the Russian uh, attach, uh, ambassador in Washington to give them a contract to steel plate the sides of four or five vessels for the Tsar's Navy. Why you would come the whole way to Pennsylvania to steel plate uh, the, the Tsar's Navy, I don't know. The contract is issued and uh, the lots are the uh, steel plates are made and, and tested. And as each one is rolled and, and, and shaped to the contour of the vessel that it's going to be screwed to, they would hang it up in the quarry wall and shoot at it to make sure that shells wouldn't go through it. Because the quality control was so bad that some lots of steel fractured immediately upon impact and some lots didn't. And they didn't know enough about how to control quality from lot to lot. So you cast 10 plates and cast one out of each 10 in uh, hopes that it stood up. Penetration was okay. Bouncing back of the shell was okay. But shattering the plate was considered another. You know. So it becomes an armor plate testing facility. Lots of guns are brought in for that purpose. By 1891, Bethany Steel has got a, a, a big contract to, as a test case, armor plate a pre-existing hull called the USS Oregon. USS Oregon was what, going to be one of the last wooden uh, battleships made. But it was just at that cusp in history. 
damn it, the czar's going to steal plate his vessels. Why can't he steal plate ours? So a contract is issued to, to provide all the necessary steel fittings for the origin. As the war clouds gather for World War II, <laughs> World War I, uh, Bethlehem Steel rents the property at high value from Mrs. Carter and plans and munitions manufacturing operation, which employed one heck of a lot of people during World War I. At the end of the armistice, it switches over for a brief time to custom cast deck fittings for ships. During the flu epidemic of 1919, they took the two largest buildings, threw everything out that was left of the manufacturing equipment, put in cots, and it became an isolation ward for flu victims from uh, Bethlehem and Easton. Uh, and the, uh, it, it lived through the flu epidemic. Nobody was buried there. They were removed to their home uh, towns for burial. After it was all over, there were these giant piles of slag left from the days that it was a, once a steel operation. And another firm comes up to Mrs. Carter and says, we'd like to rent it and take those piles of slag and turn them into house, cheap house shingles. And so the Eternal Shingle Company was, was built. And they made so many shingles that the piles of slag went down. And by about three years later, they're out of business. So, uh, a lot of use has been made of the site. This is a particular building that was used for making the armor plate for the Tsar's Navy. It, none of these exist anymore. Excuse me, did they actually take it to Russia and put it on the ship? Yes, they did indeed. Yes. Yep, they, that, that, that's right. They, they took it to Russia and installed it on the ships. So I, uh, uh, this, there are a lot of Bethlehem steel made guns that were tested there. Uh, usually cast in Bethlehem, brought out here to be tested. Uh, ah, come on, back up. Uh, previous. Previous. Oh, the next one. Ah. How do I get to back to the Do it again. Just do it again. Yep, there you go. All right. This is a fascinating quote. Eugene Clifford Grace, the CEO of the company, is there one day watching the guns being tested. Somebody could come up with this clever idea. They were still mining as much limestone as you could possibly get out of there. And the limestone was valuable. And they're testing guns. The idea is coined to use the limestone walls to receive the impact of the shells in the hopes that it'll knock down limestone. And it works. So there were several small holes dug into the face of what is called the Ziegenfuss Heilberger Quarry. It's the one now filled up with junk cars, if you know. Uh, several holes were dug in the wall at the back end of the quarry. And they would fire these 12-inch guns in it. Each gun was fired 10 times into a tunnel, which originally had been dug 10 feet into the limestone. After a 1,000 projectiles, <coughs> including from the 12-inch guns, in the testing of these guns, the tunnel was extended an additional 70 feet and its original mouth of 50 square feet was enlarged to 200 square feet. But that was part of the plan, because all the limestone it knocked down was dug out, sat on the, uh, to the furnaces in Bethlehem. Here's the Oregon. Uh, the guns, the armor on the side plate, uh, even the uh, engine mountings and the frame of the ship were uh, either made directly in Reddington or tested in Reddington. Too difficult to know, today to know which was which. All right, so it's World War I, and it's time to uh, uh, make use of the fact that there's a high bank on the south side, there's a high bank on the north side of the river. Uh, nobody cares a hell of a lot about Lower Salkin, so uh, why not put an explosives plant here? <laughs> if it blows up, it's five miles from Bethlehem, it's five miles from Eastern, and we'll miss Reddington. So, so in goes a massive shell filling uh, an uh, explosive <coughs> manufacturing site along with a gun testing range. You can walk the property today and stumble over these uh, foundations. And Bethlehem Steel, when it, when it collapsed and its legal department was abolished uh, not so many years ago, about 22 years ago, gave two large cartons of 8 by 10 glossy prints to the, uh, they're all identified, to the DuPont Museum in Wilmington. The 
Eleutherian Mills Haveley Museum of Industrial America, it's called. It's got an immense archive. If our own uh, new museum in Bethlehem had existed, they should have screamed bloody murder. But back then, uh, they didn't offer them to the County Historical Society, at least we don't think they did. Uh, off they went to Wilmington. They're nicely indexed. If you Google pictures of Reddington on the web, you'll get a hit. <coughs> visit the Eleutherian Mills Hagley Library. If you go there, they'll bring the boxes out and you can fish through them. There are hundreds of pictures of the plant being built, of people working in it, of the plant being torn down, all kinds of stuff. I've seen some tonight uh, <coughs> that I've never seen before and I don't think they're in that collection, so there must be another source. This is one that just came to me uh, about six months ago and I've sent the pictures over to you folks. Uh, the dental hygienist for uh, Raymond Haggerty, uh, whose dental practice is on Market Street in Bethlehem, uh, is a, uh, a grand niece of the two women on this picture. This one here and this one here. Uh, I think the name is Cullen. Uh, the, the, they were very, very proud of the fact that during World War I, they got hired for work, real work not just secretary work, not just being a cook, not just waiting on men at some restaurant. We were out there <coughs> putting explosive caps on shelves, dangerous work, putting ring after ring, and then carefully putting the thing on top of the shelf. We were the Reddington girls, and there were men out there hanging with heavy boxes, but we, hang, we put the shell explosive together and we never had an accident. This is a parade in Bethlehem, on the 4th of July, 1918, for something called the War Chest. The war, World War I is still going on. We're at least five months ahead of the armistice is in November. Uh, here, here's July. It, it's kind of hard to see, but since I have the original picture, you can blow it up. This says, the Reddington Girls. And, and here they are, kicking the Kaiser's ass. And there's a picture of a, uh, a woman kicking the ass of a, uh, of, of a German in a high hat. And this over here says, uh, we have work, we love it, but there are many loafing, loafing men out there who could work who aren't working, uh, pass a law and get the men to work, etc." Here's the bus that took them through the city. There was one other company in Bethlehem that employed a lot of women. It was a cigar box company over on Seneca Street in the Fountain Hill area. And it employed a lot of women and workers. It's, uh, I can't read the name now, but as a, a mutual support, the Reddington girls went to it and were photographed to try to see our company. So here's the shells. It, it's interesting that in all those boxes that Bethlehem Steel has, <clears throat> rarely do you see the women shelf of the operation. I think I've only seen two pictures of it before, either high security, the pictures he showed me tonight of the shelf building operation, there's not a woman visible, but there were hundreds of women who worked while men weren't available. Now, they quickly all lost their jobs on Armistice Day. The shelves were hauled away on trains. At one point, there were six parallel track lines leading from Reddington to the port of Newark. Six parallel lines, frequently three or four trains moving at the same time. An enormous number of shelves went out of there. Uh, six tracks. This, this is from the Glendon side, looking uh, west uh, toward Bethlehem. And there's the main shelf building plan on, on the right. Bethlehem Steel commissioned a, uh, an artist rendering of the site just prior to knocking everything down. Uh, they didn't really have a good technology to stand on the north bank of the Lehigh and take a panoramic picture. Uh, digital photography wasn't quite here yet. <laughs> but they, they did provide a, a, a scale drawing of, of the entire site. Uh, this is hanging in a public area in the library at the Hagen Museum in Wilmington. It used to hang in the legal department of Bethlehem Steel at the Martin Towers building. Uh, so the uh, uh, original still exists. This is Reddington Road coming in. I have broken this picture into segments so that you can see things uh, a little more clearly. Here's Reddington Road coming in. Here's the row of houses. 
Notice that the other portion of the tea has been taken out. As soon as they started building the shell filling plant, they needed additional space for the loading and unloading on the front end. So they took out one row of houses. So there's still one row left. This is a little tough for you to see, but there's the engine house, that giant stone structure that uh, still stands. And here's a better sh shot blown up of that piece. Here's Reddington Road coming in. This is the stone engine house. Here's the row of houses. There's the Lehigh River uh, bending around. And here's the western end of Reddington. Lenny's always promised to take me on a hike and show me the guard towers. There were a lot of guard towers around the periphery of the, the property. It was heavily guarded. Uh, I've never seen a guard tower. I'm coming from the front. Uh, maybe at twilight, he'll take us on a guided walk over the hills and we can visit Reddington. The, uh, the Reddington family had a home here. Mrs. Carter's uh, brother, uh, brother sister-in-law, and their two children. And they visited frequently. There was a lot of trouble maintaining the Lehigh Canal on the North Bank. It tended to wash out a lot they, uh, and, and break out into the river. So boating was forbidden with anything motorized on the uh, Lehigh Canal. There was an app, the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company forbid boating on the North Bank. Guess what? Mrs. Carter asks the right person, and she gets the like the number one, license number one, for a naphtha launch to run on the Lehigh Canal. Uh, she gets the only uh, naphtha launch. She has a, a, a gasoline filling station just across from Reddington on the North Bank uh, at uh, what was called for a while uh, Carter Republic Station. She has a driver. This guy, some of you may remember, this is uh, Weiss, uh, who uh, lived just over the hill here. This is Mrs. Reddington. This is uh, also Mrs. Reddington, her sister-in-law. And that's uh, this is Mrs. Carter, Mrs. Reddington, and Walter Reddington. And that's their Napa launch. A circumstance arose where the pay for the workers on both the railroad and the canal, the paychecks were late because of some kind of a bank crisis. And the workers are screaming bloody murder. I'm two days late on my paycheck. So the paymaster of both the uh, Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company and the Jersey Central Railroad asked Mrs. Carter if they could use her map launch as a traveling bank. And she said yes. And armed with a strong box and lots of paychecks, they came down. She had her driver drive the boat. And they went up the canal, paying off the, the workers uh, from a traveling map launch. The workers remembered that for a long time. Well, Mrs. Carter was bored after her husband died. Running the company was a lot of work, but it wasn't her only life. And in 1895, two and a half years after her husband's death, she meets the founder of the Lane Cedar Hope Kit Chess Company. Many of you young girls can remember the days that you had a Lane Cedar Hope Chess Company. The Lane Cedar Hope Chess Company was owned by William Rubin George of Ithaca, New York. And he made Cedar Hope Chess. He got pretty wealthy doing that. And he decided that the way kids were reformed, juvenile delinquents were reformed, sucked. He had a better system for reforming juvenile delinquents. <laughs> he created a movement called the Junior Republic Movement. The Junior Republic Movement is based on the concept that you can take some bad kids. Maybe 40% of your population can be bad kids. But the rest, 60%, have better be Christian, God-fearing, righteous, smart, the children of wealthy people who want to have a good education and mix them all up. And you'll get a leavening effect where you'll correct the juvenile delinquents by being, uh, instead of locked up in an informatory, reformatory, you'll get to go to school with some good kids. And you'll have masters holding, and in one case, doctoral holding, faculty teaching you in public schools. So that's the model. And by the time the whole movement uh, peters out in the 1930s. There's been 21 junior republics founded from coast to coast. Number two is in Reddington, on the south bank of Aliha. And uh, the motto of the junior republic movement is nothing without labor. They were paid in junior republic coinage. 
which was good only at junior public stores. So if, you sh if, you, if this showed up at Berg's Press, you would have to honor it. Uh, this is one dollar in Carter Republic uh, coinage. It's uh, 100 cents. And you got that for work. You didn't work. You, you could work overtime. There was overtime rate. And there, there were all kinds of jobs that you could do. So how did this get started? First of all, she, yeah, she, she went up to New York and saw the first Carter Junior Republic in Freeville, New York. She loved it. She wrote him a check to build an additional board. And came back and she thought about it. She said, yeah, I could support it up there, but why couldn't I do that here? And, and uh, so she brings down Mr. George from New York, says, uh, I want to create jobs for my kids. I want some place I'm going to build the Junior Republic. We're going to run with about 50 students a year. Uh, we're going to uh, do uh, seventh grade through high school. And uh, I'm going to reform it. Where should I put the dark thing? He picked the South Bank of the Lehigh. And his reasoning was, you have all this employment You've got, uh, they could work in the general store, they could help out in the post office, they could do odd jobs around the foundry. Uh, all, the, all the work of Reddington was on the South Bank. So they took the original Carter home uh, that had been on the South Bank and turned it into a, uh, a junior republic. And boy, did that not work. Because uh, <coughs> the kind of people that were out there working in that foundry had a hip flask in their pocket uh, and uh, uh, a plug of chewing back in the upper uh, vest. And they, they weren't the kind of life models that Mrs. Carter wanted her kids to have. So they're barely a year into this when she decides, I gotta get them away from this into a, a more rural environment. Fortunately, there's a farm available on the North Bank. She buys the farm on the North Bank and moves it across the North Side and operates there. She operated until 1923, full tilt. She has a stroke in 1923 and becomes partially paralyzed and is convinced God is calling her to the great junior republic of the sky. She never had a board of trustees. She never had a financial advisor. She made every decision herself. Talk about micromanagement. She would even drop in on the teachers. And if afterwards she didn't like the way a lesson was going, she'd pull the teacher aside. This was Hell on Wheels for an 1890, 1910 woman. She left no infrastructure. So she was right to be panicked at the side, side of a stroke. She actually recovered very nicely from the stroke, but she moved too fast. She closed her school at a closing ceremony, <coughs> invited in the provosts of Lehigh, Lafayette, and Penn, said, I'm going to close this operation up. Uh, I'm going to give you the money that I've used to endow it, to endow it, but I want a few things in return. I want you to start a program studying child welfare. Uh, I want you to name the professor in that chair, the Carter professor. Uh, and I want to have the right to name the first Carter professor. And he doesn't hold a PhD. He only holds a master's. Uh, if you'll take my deal, you can have my money. Lafayette said no, Lehigh said no, Penn said give me your tired report. Oh, <laughs> so the thing moves to Penn. Uh, this is the farm she bought on the North Shore at North Bank, pictured in 1874. We have a color picture of it that survives from a calendar. That, 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 this was called the Shimer Food Stock Farm. And it, it raised all kinds of ornamental uh, trees, uh, apples, pears, there was a road to Easton. Uh, this, is, this is parallel to Freemansburg Avenue. Here's the Lehigh Road. <coughs> it's a little bit stylized, but here's the uh, Jersey Central Railroad. I want you to notice the building. There are no wings on that building. Notice the two chimneys, the pointed <laughs> structure in the middle. She buys this property, about 280 acres. Some of it is now owned by St. Luke's, the western easternmost end of it is part of St. Louis. She builds two wings on it. Uh, one for boys, one for girls. Uh, she has, hires a house mother and a house father. They aren't married to each other, but they are separately married, uh, and uh, they provide discipline. 
she creates a, a beautiful terrace uh, uh, flagstone patio in front of the house and clears the trees so that you can look down onto Reading. This is a picture of 192, and there's that Ziegenfuss Halberg crawl quarry that will later be filled up with junk cars. So you're looking from the north to the south uh, 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 across the river. This is called the H.H. Adams Terrace. So what did you get the kids to work doing? They did everything. First of all, they were a republic. So every year they had to discover the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution all over again. Guided in the discovery. We're going to write a constitution. We're going to set up our own laws. And then we're going to elect our own officers. And we're going to enforce things. You've got to be in bed at a certain time. You know, uh, you've got to have the buttons button uniform. You can't miss a button on the, uh, on the bottom. There are all these rules that, that, that they passed. And uh, you could be fined if you uh, didn't obey them. There were tasks to be learned out in the dairy, in the farm, uh, in the orchard. Work, work for women and work for men. All the junior republics tried to be co-ed. They all ran into the option with the uh, juvenile delinquent girl claiming rape. It happens at various times. All 22 of them confronted the same issue, I would say girl, but uh, uh, some girl sat there who didn't want to be there. In several cases, there were a fire bug. In one case, she shot her mother. Uh, that was the one in Chino, California. And she's not there two weeks till uh, my teacher raped me. My te uh, what's the public going to believe? So it lasted till 1908 with girls here. And then they had a rape charge, and she closed the girls' wing down. Ru William Reuben George survived four charges of rape. He kept girls in his perm premises, working uh, with men uh, the whole time. Uh, and. Uh, but he was the only junior republic that did. So this was the superintendent. He was a Lafayette College bachelor's degree in divinity. He was bound for Princeton Theological Seminary to get a theological degree. She intercepted him and said, I've got a chance for you to do God's work right here in Lower Salkin Township and uh, uh, at Reddington. He agreed and Lafayette gave him an honorary master's degree at her request the year she had her stroke. And first thing that, first honorary master I ever heard of out of Lafayette. Didn't go so far as to give him an honorary doctor, gave him an honorary master. <clears throat> and armed with that honorary masters and the $200,000 his boss had, he gets a full professorship <coughs> and <clears throat> Wish we could do that at Lehigh. Anyway, <laughs> this is the second Carter Cottage. This was <coughs> in a fire in 1933. It's on the intersection of Freemansburg Avenue and Freemansburg Avenue and Farmersville Road. This is the officers of the Junior Republic. Gee, Zooey, you're getting spazzed. <laughs> That's the officers of the Junior Republic standing on the porch of the Junior Republic in 2004, 1904. Here's the court in session. The Supreme Court in, in session. Somebody is being sworn in, and somebody's going to be tried for a violation of an offense. You know, they built their own jail. The jail still exists and is used to store the lawn equipment for the present owners of the property. It's a handsome jail. Uh, here's the jail, upper left. As you might expect, it's uh, got bar-covered windows. It's covered with uh, ivy here. Uh, and it's about good for storing lawn equipment. <laughs> but it, it had uh, cells in it in its day. One of the stranger businesses that they ran, that the boys really loved, was a system of providing relief for mules on the towpath. There was always a watcher posted at the flagpole on the Adams Terrace, uh, listening for a contract. Uh, the uh, canal boats were told, and they all knew this, that if you wanted to save your mules and put your mules on board, either going toward Bethlehem or going the other way toward East, blow the conch horn three times, and uh, our boys will intercept you with a team of fresh mules. Uh, put your mules on board, run with our mules, no further than Freemansburg on one end, no further than Easton on the other end, and, and, and we'll come back. It, it cost you the grand sum of a quarter 
but you got to, if your mules got a chance to get on board, have a leisurely lunch, etc. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I interviewed this guy at, at, at death's door in the 1970s, a guy named Charles Brett. Uh, I don't know what he looked like then. I only ever met one of the uh, Junior Republic citizens uh, face to face, and I'll show you him shortly. He was a principal of an elementary school in Lebanon, PA. But I interviewed both of these guys, and I interviewed the widows of about five of them. This is the baseball team in 1913. Here's that same guy that was on the lower right of that picture. I had an extensive correspondence uh, with this guy, Charles Gilbert, who became an engineer on the trans trans Canada Railroad. He lived in Moncton, uh, Canada, and uh, he had, was an American citizen who just migrated up there after uh, uh, he actually engaged in an uh, armed robbery uh, and kind of rare for, for the 1890s but he had so uh, he gets sent away to the uh, reformatory the terminology was uh, farm lizzies and house jennies the girls were called house jennies and then were called farm lizzies picture of them bringing in the hay this is Charles Gilbert. He was the milk truck driver. He delivered milk to Freemansburg from the dairy. He had some great pictures of himself loading milk cans. Uh, he didn't want to leave. He was so happy there that uh, he wanted to stay. Got lots of pictures of the guns on the North Bank. This woman lived to 93 years old. She was uh, Molly Palin Mellon. Uh, she was a house mother. And uh, I had the great pleasure of interviewing her face to face in a number of circumstances. She lived in Phillipsburg. Uh, Mrs. Carter came for a frequent visit, always dressed to the nines in the latest Paris fashions. Uh, and there she is standing on the porch. She ran a Founders Day ceremony every year, and she came for commencement. Mm -hmm. I think I told you I'm wearing a graduation pin, a Carter Jr. Republic uh, graduate. So you uh, uh, courtesy of Molly Mellon, Molly Payne Mellon, who was a graduate herself of the program. This is the annual school book. Here's Founders Day, generally held on the lawn in October. Mrs. Carter usually spoke, but she often had somebody else speak. This is the graduation pin at the top and the, the, the one dollar coin that you earned while working there. And this is what I call the last homecoming. Uh, I struggled hard. At the time I was doing this, in 1980, there were six of them still alive. Uh, kind of far spread. The one was in Moncton, Canada. One was in Rhode Island. Uh, one was in Atlanta, Georgia. Molly Palin Mellon was in Phillipsburg. And Roth was in Lebanon. Uh, he was nearly blind when his daughter grew up. And I arranged with the owners of the house to have a uh, the reunion. So <clears throat> these are the two of them in the schoolroom. Uh, Lawrence Roth on the left, uh, he was a firebug. He had uh, in a fit of pissed off and this burned down his family's chicken coop. <laughs> and, uh, so he gets sent off here. Uh, he uh, finds salvation, uh, goes to Kutztown, uh, becomes a teacher, and eventually ends up a principal in a school in Rome. And that's Molly Pale and Mellon on the right. All right, time to wrap up. I had a lot of help doing this. Uh, Mrs. Austin here was a, a, quite a good source of interviewing. And she's put me in touch with an Italian chap who was part of the last uh, steel working crew on the premises named Ulysses Cristiani. He was alive then. Uh, he lived uh, up behind the fire company in Steel City. And I uh, interviewed a lot of widows and uh, citizens. Now, I want to close with two appeals. If you ever go to Philadelphia, do it soon. Uh, go to Laurel Hill Cemetery. Go to Mausoleum Row. Go to Mausoleum Row in Laurel Hill Cemetery. And walk down from the farther eastern end to the third mausoleum down on your right. Listen very carefully. Because you will hear rolling and churning and, 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 and grinding. What is happening is the bones of William T. Carter, uh, who ironically founded this town, 
A town that meant a lot to him, and also founded the United Gas Improvement Company, <laughs> the company who is now pushing a pipeline through his town. I call this irony. <laughs> Just sort of appreciate how it's uh, Because the historicity of Reddington is about to be destroyed by a pipeline. There are lots of ways of looking at this. This is the 1873 map, pipeline superimposed on the red. It's going to cross the Lehigh uh, just slightly to the uh, east of the uh, engine house and over top of the foundation of the uh, Clark Hotel. It's then going to veer to the west and follow Reddington Road. Viewed from the top, here it is sweeping across the Pitchell Farm and, 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 uh, and Lower Sauvage. Here's another view, a stylized one. It doesn't show your, your Hellertown lateral, which is going to provide you all this gas that you need uh, for presently for the uh, uh, station over on the uh, uh, Hellertown <coughs> needs, needs, needs more gas. So here's 78. We are here, uh, right here, at the intersection of uh, Apple Butter Road, and here's the interstate. The Hellertown Lateral will run down this bank uh, uh, along here. And the, uh, not more than, you're, you're within the blast zone. The blast zone of a 36 inch pipe uh, filled with gas at 1200 PSI is about a half a mile. So you're toast. <laughs> uh, and here, here it goes. All right. Just to leave you with a pleasant thought. <laughs> One more pleasant thought. Please do consider volunteering. County Historic Society needs volunteers uh, of all kinds. And any skill you have is a skill they need. Thanks for your patience. A sale, a sale on books, five bucks a piece.